Hey everybody, and welcome to Travel Faithfully. Today was an especially long edition because we're learning about St. Nicholas von Flew, my 14th great grandfather, here in Saxon, Switzerland. This white building right here is the Museum of Bruder Klaus. Uh, that was the name that that St. Nicholas von Flew took for himself after he uh, became a hermit and started living that kind of life. Beside me is the uh, Catholic Cathedral in Saxon, and you can hear some Christmas songs being sung back over here. Um, and part of the reason that we're here in this space is because the, in the Lutheran Church, which didn't exist at the time of St. Nicholas, who was around in the 1400s, born in 1417, uh, we believe all people are simultaneously saints and sinners. Each and every one of us have bits that are sacred and loved and named by God, and bits that we wish we could do better with in ways that we're, maybe we're sinners. But the spirit of this sainthood that we have is being celebrated behind me. This is the the Christmas market here in Saxon, where the spirit of Christmas is alive with people of faith who are trying to share holiday cheer. And if there is anything more saintly than groups of people trying to love and care for each other, trying to share the the celebration of God's birth. I don't know what is more saintly than that. And so join me on this journey to learn about one person, uh, St. Nicholas, but also hopefully to get your Christmas spirit going and find out ways that you can be a saint in this world too. This is Pastor Megan and I am in Saxon, Switzerland in a chapel here that is honoring Bruder Klaus or St. Nicholas, my 14th great grandfather. And this beautiful, beautiful church is pretty amazing. Uh, one of the reasons that I'm here is to think about St. Nicholas and what he was up to. He lived in the 1400s and his miracle was that he um, didn't eat food for 20 years. All he ate was communion bread and host, and he had 10 children, and according to his wife, his call was to pray, and so she was okay with him becoming a hermit. And um, being in this beautiful mystical part of Switzerland, what I think is interesting about his journey is that he wanted to be alone and pray, but the Pope at the time decided he was a living saint. And so if you touched him, you got to know for certain that you got to go to heaven. He was an indulgence. And so this guy who only wanted to be alone had people chasing him around to touch him wherever he would go. And so they built him a, a space where he could live that was next to the chapel. And um, one of the cool things you can find if you come here to Switzerland is not only to learn more about St. Nicholas, but to see some of the things that he carried with him. So here we have a candle with, with uh, Nicholas on one side and the Swiss army on the other side wearing the, the Swiss outfits that they wear at the Vatican because St. Nicholas was the patron saint of Switzerland for convincing them to no longer be a part of civil war because he believed that war was bad for everyone. Um, they didn't have PTSD back then, but he knew the ravages of war and the way that um, pillaging all of the lands around you was very bad for Switzerland as people went off towards war. Over here is Brother Nicholas's robe. And based on how tiny it is, you can see I'm a little bit larger than my ancestor. But these simple hermit's outfits is a way to kind of get rid of from some of the choices that you have in life to simplify your life and find a way to uh, put all of your time, put all of your energy, all of your focus into loving God and learning about God and praying. And that was part of the aesthetic of being a hermit. And I'll tell you a little bit more about this journey as we head along to the next place. Here we have the house of St. Nicholas, Brother Klaus, Buddha Klaus. Uh, where he lived with his wife Dorothea and their ten kids. Well, 
he moved out to become a hermit when they decided that he would do that because he was feeling afflicted while the tenth child was in his wife's belly. Those who think that St. Nicholas was um, more on the saintly side than the human side say that Dorothea, it was her idea that she gave his blessing knowing that he was called to pray and to a life of prayer. Um, he was originally supposed to set off on a pilgrimage where he would go and journey towards sacred sites throughout Switzerland and throughout the world and, and kind of end his life in an unknown place because they probably wouldn't hear about it when he passed away. But seven years later, Bruticlaus's brother walks past him in the woods, barely recognizes him because he's so emaciated from not having eaten and uh, living in the woods, and uh, lets his family know that he's around in the area. And after it, the word gets out that he has become a hermit, something that um, was revered in Switzerland, even when, when St. Nicholas was a small child, they decide that he's a saint, saint amongst their mitts. And down this hill, right over here, the folk who think that he's a living saint build him a, a cell that he can live in and a chapel where he can worship. I'll show you where that is in a second. But first, let's peep through these windows. I don't know if you can see that. No, it's a little bit reflecty. It's mostly just empty space. These aren't the real buildings where they lived. It's just a uh, replica that they made because of course wood houses depreciate. Some of the materials are the same, but they wanted a place for people to have reverence and to be able to kind of understand what Nicholas's life was like. The interesting thing about this space, see there's a barn out here as well, is that just up the street is the house where St. Nicholas is said to have been born in, which was also replicated, looks like almost identical to this house here. We, well me, unbeknownst knowing that this was my 14th great grandfather's land, booked the hotel right there. And so during my time in Switzerland, we've been staying on the exact same farmland as my kin who owned all of this farmland around. Well, some people might think that having 10 children, of course, is very difficult on St. Dorothea, which is what when uh, St. Nicholas was canonized in 1945, they said Dorothea probably was the saint because she had all of those kids and she let uh, Nicholas have a life of prayer. Um, but that the more kids you had in a space like this, the more wealth you had because you could have more cows, you could have more agriculture, you could have more land. And so that's just a, a something that maybe you didn't know about this kind of space. Let's see where I end up next. Below me, you can see Nicholas's hermitage cell that was built for him by the townspeople who didn't want him to live out in the middle of the wilderness in a little hut anymore. They built him a chapel and a chapel where the pilgrims would come to try to see Nicholas and get instruction from him. It's the place you'd come if you wanted to get that indulgence, where if you touched him, you got to be assured that you would go to heaven forever. And uh, you can see it's a nice little jaunt. That's the hotel we're staying at over there. So I've been on about a, a 20 minute walk to kind of recreate St. Nicholas's footsteps. One thing that I found from other monasteries and other pilgrimage sites in other countries is that they tend to be in places where there are beautiful views, where you can meditate and pray to God, and that you're doing that can be done through seeing how beautiful the nature and the world around you is. And here in Switzerland, that is certainly the case. Inside these uh, two chapels that are built here, um, in part because St. Nicholas is so popular, they have to have two separate church spaces where people can worship. Um, inside those two, two church spaces and some of the, the chapels where St. Nicholas used to pray, a lot of icons have been added after that to kind of narrate the story of St. Nicholas and to narrate the, the Bible stories that people think are very important. But remember, it was a, probably a lot less distracting during Nicholas's day. Behind me, we have Bruticlaus's cell. It's not the original, but it's made and restored with some of the original wood and made to look like it used to look. Tiny little window to see what's out in the world. Let's see what's in here. Uh, 
lots of stuff on the wall. These are different uh, thank yous from people around the world. Climb up the stairs very slowly. I don't know if you saw it. Underneath these stairs that I'm climbing up is a tiny little basement. We get up here and you can see that view from his window. It's very pretty out there. Not too bad. And now let's see. There's his actual cell with the door and a very tiny little door. If we're gonna make it in here. And this cell was only this big. I'm 5'11", and I would not have fit on this bench where he laid his head on a rock to sleep. And there's a, his small little basement space, and the view this way out the window, again, not so bad, especially if this was the, the home where he had grown up. And uh, the thing that I think is kind of neat about this cell is that he has a window that looks into the special chapel that was built for him. And during the time when people were coming here because St. Because Nicholas was an indulgence and if you touched him, it meant you got to go to heaven forever. I can imagine attending church through this window rather than going down there to sit next to people who all want to touch you might have been the biggest gift that Nicholas could have had. Um, there are... There is um, ideas about St. Nicholas, some who err on the side of him being a saint, all the way, all the way miraculous saint, and um, other stories that, that paint him a little more human than others. Um, the, the story that paints him a little bit more human, if you don't believe that someone could go 20 years without eating and, and fasting, is that St. Nicholas was able to eat communion. And because the chapel was near here, he could eat any time he wanted communion. And there was an on-call pastor who would serve him communion whenever he was interested. And of course it was for purely Jesus reasons, um, but also because the bread at that time was thick enough and had enough nutrients in it that it could have sustained him for 20 years and, and until he reached the age of 70 when he passed away. So here you are inside St. Nicholas's tiny cell. There's a crucifix on the wall. And then of course this painting that I showed you uh, in the other chapel. It's a little bit darker. I'm not certain if, my guess is this probably isn't the original, um, but it definitely looks different than the paintings we've seen in other places. Look, Jesus's face is a little bit different. He's a little more beardy. Um, and so it's an interesting, it'd be hard to see. Um, he'd probably be using wooden candles and uh, yeah, you'd uh, have to, probably a small amount of time during the day when the light would be enough to let you see that area. So this is what a saint's cell looks like. My guess is he was shorter than me. So here's the view from the other side of St. Nicholas's cell. And in here is that chapel that was built for him. The idea is that the people of his town and his area were so certain that he was a saint living amongst them that they wanted to not wait until he had passed away to pray to him for miracles. This beautiful sanctuary space has old, old paintings about uh, St. Nicholas's life and uh, is very beautiful. Again, it's got that beautiful ceiling and you've got Bruder Klaus on the wall again and candles that are lit every day, all the time. It's a very beautiful place that you could spend hours and hours in. And uh, remember what that is? It's a spot where Nicholas could peek through from his cell and watch church happen. There are stories of fancy people coming here for advice. Uh, the locals say that he was as famous as the Dalai Lama in terms of people wanting to come and get religious advice from him because he had helped kind of to prevent that that Swiss Civil War that I told you about earlier. And so afterwards, you'd go around the side to his door and try to have a word with him. 
um, but he could decide if he wanted to see you or not. Or if he was sitting here in the chapel, he could make a quick exit and, and get out for fear that too many people were gonna grab him, like I said earlier. So if you make it to Switzerland, stop by. This is a pretty cool place. Here uh, is the second cathedral of St. Nicholas, a space where um, people came to worship because in the 1500s, more people were coming to pilgrimage than could fit in the original chapel up the hill next to Bruder Klaus's cell. Uh, the painting in the back shows Bruder Klaus on top of these skeletons and preventing war. It was painted in like 1914, so you can even see an American flag over on this side um, and showing that Bruder Klaus's vision of God, which you can see better over here um, on the top of the sanctuary and maybe even more clearly over here in this replica of the painting that was in Bruder Klaus's cell, this idea of God's face and this wheel, which you can find in Hindu scripture, you can find it in Tibetan imagery, you can find it in Ezekiel's wheel, but that's not stuff other than the Ezekiel's wheel, stuff that uh, Bruder Klaus would have known about because again, he wasn't a traveled guy. Um, this originally was painted in, in Bruder Klaus's cell. You won't be able to see it when we go in there because it'll be a little bit dark. And again, you can see some of the images from the Bible that Nicholas thought was the most important. Many of these images involving Mary, the mother of Jesus, and of uh, Jesus' death on the cross, and then the four Gospels, and that being the bits that he thought were the most important to know about the world. On the sides of this chapel are pictographs of uh, St. Nicholas's life. They were painted in the 1500s, so a bit, some, many of them are, are getting a bit faded. I'll show you some of the pictures in between this video, um, and you can check more out on my Facebook page if you really want to see more of them. Uh, but it's a very interesting and beautiful space where you can come and meditate. Like, even the ceiling is beautiful, right? I'm here now in the chapel in St. Nicholson, a town in... Switzerland at a church that St. Nicholas used to come and pray at, and he had to take the same 30 to 40 minute walk uphill I just took, maybe longer because he was fasting. Um, these ancient paintings on the wall are a hundred different paintings of Bible stories. And they're particularly important in churches like this because people like uh, St. Nicholas were illiterate. They couldn't read. And they had to depend on the priest telling them stories of the Bible. Um, but these pictures helped a little bit and helped show people ways that the stories about God were interesting. And it wasn't just because it was beautiful. It was practical. It was the catechism. It was the words about God. So that even if you drifted off a bit, from what the sermon was talking about, you still were contemplating the nature of God and the people who could inspire you to love God better. These paintings weren't here when St. Nicholas was here. They were added much later. Um, but this, again, is another space where the scenery helps you to see how beautiful everything was. Uh, but one of the things I want to point out before I show you how beautiful it is outside is this right here. Underneath where the pastor preaches is a skull. See the skull? And that would be kind of the Lenten reminder, reminding you that you're mortal, that you're going to die at some point, and to remember that part of the reason that you need God's love is because of your own frailty. Now let's look at the sanctuary of St. Nicholas, which is right out these doors. I'm gonna be careful because it's icy and I don't want to fall over. Ready for it? Hello, Switzerland. Check that out. Now you're not gonna be able to see me now because the beauty of this space is, is so 
blooming wonderful. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful place here in Switzerland. And pilgrimage sites like this, where you have to walk a really long way to go to that beautiful place, makes it feel kind of worth it to get to celebrate and worship God. It makes it feel special, up on high on the mountain, kind of like where Moses was worshiping and where Jesus was going when he'd go to get closer to God. And you can really see how people would have just a beautiful kind of faith in these spaces. But it wasn't just nature that St. Nicholas was into. One of the common themes at these different uh, sanctuaries that, that Nicholas was headed to was their reverence, not only for Jesus and for these kind of stories of the sacred. You can see Jesus up there on the cross with all of those beautiful paintings surrounded. But one of the things that I think is really neat is the reverence that was held for this person. Mary, St. Nicholas, one of his greatest uh, uh, spiritual icons and people that he meditated on the most was Mary, Mary the mother of Jesus. And maybe that's because his own wife had 10 children and he understood how important mothers are. Maybe it's because uh, uh, his wife was important in his own story, as you'll see uh, from when I was talking at their house. Um, but I like this idea of, of even, even though contemporary society may have maybe cemented in time or cemented in paintings, a lot of male images about who are the faithful people of God, it was not always quite been that way. And just because, you know, these frescoes were painted at a certain time doesn't mean that that's the only way to be faithful. And actually, it wouldn't be fair to just say that these are only only males up here, because there's quite a few ladies up here that are our spiritual leaders of faith. So uh, just remember, the full diversity of God's creation is in the full diversity of sacred icons, it's in the full diversity of sacred scriptures, it's in the full diversity of sacred text and sacred stories throughout all of history. This idea that people who are diverse are new, it's a new progressive thing that we're able to finally understand and it would be new to our ancestors and faith, doesn't make any sense because if you look hard enough in those pictures up there, you'll find all kinds of fun people, whether it's Joan of Arc, who, who was beheaded, uh, not beheaded, she was killed, uh, burned at the stake because she refused to stop wearing men's clothing, right? And so don't let people lie to you and tell you that the diversity you have is beyond a diversity that God can love. It's not true. God loves you and there's nothing anybody else can do about it. Here I am at the small chapel on the side of the Saxon Cathedral where we have the final resting place of St. Nicholas or Bruder Klaus. You can see there was another spot in there too. The original stone um, on the bottom and then a second stone that was created in later times on the top. Um, I believe, if I'm correct, that his remains have been moved inside into the where the altar space is. Maybe it's in this altar. I'm gonna research it and, and figure it out later. It's not clear my German's, Swiss German isn't good enough to figure it out just from these altar spaces. Um, and let that be a lesson. Anyone who thinks they know everything there is to know about any sacred space is full of it. Uh, there's always more to learn. These medallions, I think, are kind of cool and very interesting. It's part of the reason that St. Nicholas is a saint at all. Each of these medallions represents a miracle that someone attributes to their prayers, either to their visit to this site or to their prayers to St. Saint, to Saint Nicholas or Ber Berger Kraus. And they represent the part of the body that was healed kind of miraculously through prayer. That's one of the steps of becoming a truly beatified saint, which happened for St. Nicholas in 1947. Um, and so the heart, if you see the heart, is because someone wanted their heart healed. There's a leg, someone had an injured leg that was healed. Someone's eye was having problems. Um, and it's a very interesting thing to see. Someone had a baby. Uh, and so there was a lot of 
look at how many miracles that represents, the number of lives that were touched by someone who wasn't alive. And that's one of the interesting things that happens in the Christian churches. We think that people who are not alive can still have an effect, whether it's through the community of saints, the people who have passed down faith to us, whether it's through noticing that miracles can happen, that things beyond what is obvious can happen. You don't have to believe in miracles or in saints or frankly even in Jesus to see the sacred in beautiful, mysterious things, to honor ancestry and to, to find ways to see loving kindness coming from family members and to even see the ways that beautiful babies born into the world can make the life of the world better. Let's see uh, how you will understand yourself as a saint as a result of this journey that I'm on. I'll have a few thoughts about that in a second. So that's my little Travel Faithfully video about uh, St. Nicholas von Flew. I'm sure it's a different St. Nicholas than you think about when you think about Christmas time. But I've got a little bit of a glue vine, which is a warm kind of spiced wine. It's good. Very sweet. And my hope is that uh, St. Nicholas's life has encouraged you to think of ways that you can be kind to your neighbors, build community wherever you are, enjoy the beautiful sacredness around you, and uh, when you're able to uh, journey to beautiful places, either in person or via video. Lots of love to all of you. Take care.